This is Friday, April 13, 2018. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. We are privileged to have with us today Arno Lassard, who will talk about his father, Arnold Lassard. Welcome, Arno. Thank you. It's good to be here. May I ask when your father was born? Yes, my father was born October 9, 1923. And where was he born? He was born in Newburyport, Massachusetts. And tell us uh, uh, what your father told you about how, what life was like in Newburyport. Uh, during those days, life was very hard. Um, my father was very fortunate. Um, his father, my grandfather Fred, or his father Fred, ran um, a small grocery store downtown. So um, they were fortunate. They were considered uh, to be in what would have been called the lower middle class. Um, as I mentioned, they always had food on the table and uh, uh, a warm house, um, which wasn't the case for many people. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather worked six days a week in that grocery store, and my father worked with him six days a week in that grocery store. Um, so everyone had to contribute, and I think that it was a strong basis for his understanding of um, his work ethic. Uh, he always would refer back to a statement, which I'm not sure if it came from my grandfather or the, or the service, but I think it was a service, and he would always say, Order breeds order, and disorder breeds disorder. And did, uh, were there any siblings along with your father? My father had two sisters, two younger sisters, uh, Dorothy Phillips and Helen Sullivan, who were still alive. Um, any brothers? He did not. Okay. And I understand your father was also very interested in music. Yes, he was. He was a classically trained pianist from an early age. Um, and it was interesting. He always told me that although he liked the piano lessons, that he found them a little tedious at first. And they paid off in spades as later in his life, as a late teenager after high school, he had started his own band. It was a small, a small big band, so to speak. It was about 12 members. And they used to gig from... Uh, Boxford, Massachusetts, up to Hampton Beach, um, and they would rent out um, dance halls and perform on the weekends. Did your father graduate from Newburyport High School? He did, actually. He was the first graduating class of Newburyport High School. And of course, your father ran the band. Yes, he actually owned the band and he ran the, the band. So okay. uh, he would um, pay the musicians based on their skill level and uh, his right hand man would go out and find the musicians. My father would actually go out and purchase this sheet music, um, book the gigs and rent the um, practice space uh, in the report uh, where the, the band would practice before their, uh, their gigs. <laughs> and what did your father tell you about what was happening when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor? I remember him telling me uh, he was at home with his family. Uh, they were listening to it on the radio. And uh, it was a moment that they would never forget because it was so surreal that it was actually going on. And um, at that point in time, he uh, was making you know, a strong decision to enlist. And when did your father enlist? He enlisted in 1943. And what branch? Uh, he enlisted into the United States Army. And why did he choose the Army? I don't recall actually why he chose the Army, but it was very interesting. Um, shortly after joining the Army, he made the decision knowingly that he wanted to uh, be in the Air Corps portion of it. I do believe that there was um, a desire to be in the Army because his father, Fred, had served in the Army in its Air Corps during the First World War as a mechanic on airplanes. 
Very interesting. And um, did he tell you a little more about Fred? Did he, was he overseas? Was he stateside? He was actually stateside. Okay. And uh, he was a mechanic um, working on airplanes uh, where the, the pilots were basically mm -hmm. uh, doing their testing and getting their hours. Mm -hmm. um, so he was making sure that those airplanes were up and running. Okay. And your father, of course, when he enlisted, he had to be sent to basic. Where was he sent? Uh, he did his basic training in Virginia. And you were telling me uh, some of his experience in the store paid off. It did. Um, working in a grocery store five days a week for a few hours every day, um, my father would have to be very quick with his arithmetic because uh, they didn't have a cash register, so um, all of the items that were purchased would be written down on the back of a small brown paper bag um, and then added up. So um, his math skills had to be quick and sharp. And um, it did pay off in dividends. Um, I recall him saying that he was on a long march uh, with his backpack under the sweltering, sweltering heat and he was looking up in the sky and he was seeing the airplanes overhead and he thought, you know, that's really where I'd like to be. And so um, not too long after there, uh, he told me he heard over the radio there was an announcement that uh, there was going to be opportunity uh, to test into uh, a different uh, branch of the Army. And they were uh, doing some testing for the Army Air Corps. Um, and he definitely took advantage of that testing and uh, before he knew it he was on his way to his um, Air Corps basic training to learn to fly um, where uh, not too long after that he was um, promoted to uh, a bombardier navigator and that was his, uh, his, his position as a navigator and eventually a navigator instructor uh, for the remainder of the war. Okay. Where was he sent for basic for uh, aviation? No, I don't recall. I do know that he was in California for a stint. Okay. Um, as well. He actually trained in three parts of the country. He was in Virginia. He was down south. Um, uh, and then I know he was in California for a stint. Mm -hmm. And what kind of planes was he trained to fly? Uh, he was trained to fly B-17s and B-25s. Okay. And did he have any stories about that part of his life? Oh, he had so many stories. Um, you know, he would get up with his team and they'd pull off, take off off the runway, and at that point they'd be able to open their sealed orders. And they had no idea where they were going and all of a sudden they would take a new course and a new heading. So they'd leave Washington and have orders to fly to Bangor, Maine, for example, uh, or they'd have orders to be heading to um, the West Coast and then off to Japan, or at some points in time flying back across the Atlantic uh, to Pompeii, New Guinea, and then ending up in the Philippines. Um, one great story I recall, um, his, B-17 actually was being used as um, a test plane for new technology. So the uh, gunny turret was taken out of the bottom and uh, radar technology was put into that. Uh, very interestingly enough, his uh, olive drab green plane was then repainted jet black and they were uh, flying night missions and surveillance and they were testing this new radar technology. So they were flying at night, they were flying through heavy rain, flying through fog and testing to see how the radar would act over land and over water and how they could pick up new readings and they were making recommendations on how the new technology was working and how they could use it. Um, and this was extremely important as he was a navigator but also bombardment officer. Um, so a very interesting period of time. He told me one story where they ended up landing in Bangor and um, they landed the plane at night and all of a sudden there was uh, a Jeep that didn't realize and didn't notice the black B-17 parked on uh, the runway 
and the Jeep collided straight into the rear rudder of the plane. Uh, they were stuck in Bangor for almost three and a half weeks waiting for parts uh, to be delivered. And there's your father twiddling his thumbs. <laughs> I know, ba Bangor, Maine, during the war. Okay. And how long was he doing this part? He was in the Army Air Corps during the Second World War for almost four years. Mm -hmm. um, he eventually was stationed in Japan during the occupation of Japan after the end of the war. Okay. And uh, did he say anything about that part of his story? Oh, he had a wonderful time um, during the entire the entire wartime effort. Um, I think he was very fortunate because he was not in the face of um, active battle. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of what his time of service was doing was in research and development. Um, and then later on, while he was stationed in Japan, he was in the fifth um, in the Air Corps. Uh, he was doing more statistical and managerial work uh, under a one-star general on base uh, during the occupation, um, ensuring that uh, the new flyboys were staying in the air and making sure that the planes were up and running and that um, things were running smoothly. Okay. And what was his rank at the time? He was a captain. And did he say anything about now, being in Japan right after the war, did he have a chance to see any of the bomb damage at Hiroshima and Nagasaki? He did. It was um, a life-changing experience for him. My father grew up uh, with a very strong faith. He was an altar boy. And uh, he, hands down, remembers the day he lost his faith. And it was the day that he flew over Hiroshima after the bombs had been, the bomb had been dropped. And he said, you know, from his vantage point, uh, flying only at a couple thousand feet, for as far as the eye could see, all there was left was twisted metal and rubble. And um, that day was life changing for him because he clearly, in himself lost his direction and his faith uh, at that point in time. And there was another story you told before the interview of what your father did while he was stationed in Japan, uh, how to keep the younger pilots... Airborne. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's quite an interesting story, actually. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> As the more experienced veterans had served and were leaving Japan, all of the new young uh, officers were coming in. And uh, this is now post-war, and it's a different generation. And uh, a lot of these gentlemen hadn't been away from home before or away from the States, and they were now in foreign lands. And um, what was happening was all of a sudden, the base commander, who was a one-star general, realized that the venereal disease rate was starting to spike out of control. And all these new flyboys were having affairs uh, left, right, and center. And they were ending up, more often than not, in sick bay. And when you're in sick bay with a venereal disease, you're not flying or logging your hours. And if you're not logging your hours, all of a sudden you lose your flying status. And so this was actually becoming a big problem. Um, and what my father at the time was ordered to do, uh, as he was not only in charge of statistics for the base, um, but was to remedy the issue. And so uh, they went ahead and constructed um, a new structure. Uh, and uh, he was tasked to go out and find uh, uh, some geisha girls and uh, with working with uh, the medical officers, they came up with a program uh, for the Flyboys to 
uh, amuse themselves, so to speak, and uh, they would go into uh, the facility, uh, they would get prophylactics, and they would have a swab on the way in, they'd have their time with a geisha girl, and get a swab on the way out, and uh, <laughs> they were having protected sex uh, at that point. And uh, after a number of weeks, the venereal disease rate was controlled, the fly boys were up flying, they were getting their hours, and problem solved. That's one way to do it. Credit your father. <laughs> and how long was he stationed in Japan? Um, for approximately two years. And tell us what happened afterward. Uh, when he was discharged from the Army Air Corps, um, he came back to Massachusetts and um, under the GI Bill, he uh, took advantage of that and attended Boston University, uh, where he received his bachelor's degree in just uh, just under three years, actually. He was uh, he was laughing at the fact that he was going to school with, with, with men and women much younger than him, and uh, he uh, had spent enough time in barracks. He didn't want to spend any more time in dormitories. So. Uh, he was taking as many classes as he could during the intercession and summer session, uh, and so he kind of uh, expedited uh, his, his bachelor's degree and then ended up going to New York and attending Columbia University, um, getting his uh, master's degree in um, history, uh, and then doing postmaster's work. He was actually about uh, to finish his doctorates um, when he actually took a job on Long Island as a um, high school English and history professor where he taught the 11th and 12th grade. He was there on Long Island for about two years when he was subsequently recalled into active military service for the Korean War. Mm -hmm. Now was your father married at the time? Yes. And, but no children yet? That's correct. So he was recalled into service. Yes. And tell us what happened when he was recalled. Of course. Um, so he reported um, in to uh, be formally recalled. He determined his papers. And uh, the gentleman that was going to assist him with the reenlistment um, looked into his file and saw that he had done studies at Columbia. And um, was really interested with his line of studies and with some of the professors that he studied under and uh, told my father that he was going to do something for him. And uh, my father was a little uh, skeptical, thinking, um, yeah, buddy, what are you going to do for me? <laughs> and he said, no, no, come back tomorrow and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what we've done. So my father came back the next day and um, the gentleman said, well, I did it. And uh, my father said, well, we, what did you do? And he said, well, I can't tell you. It's classified. Um, he says, but you need to go report to someone else. And so he gave my father some directions and someone else he needed to report to. And um, lo and behold, uh, the post that my father ended up with uh, was on a strategic panel for executive development um, for what is currently the NSA. And he served two years um, during the Korean War at mm -hmm. the Pentagon, um, resourcing um, and teaching, coaching, and training uh, director level uh, staff on recruiting mm -hmm. uh, skills and development skills and management skills. And for the record, what does the NSA stand for? The National Security Agency. And how long was he stationed in the Pentagon? He served for two years under active military status, and he was honorably discharged uh, after two years of service and was um, retained in his role for an additional two years as a civilian. And what rank did he, uh, when he was taken out of the Army, or Air Force, I should say, what was his rank? Uh, his rank was captain. He was still a captain, okay. Mm -hmm. So was he doing pretty much the same thing as a civilian 
that he was doing as a captain. He was. They had a lot of work to do. Mm. And um, it was very interesting work. Uh, and um, it was the beginning foundation levels of, of what the NSA is today. And so um, it was very interesting for him. Mm -hmm. Now, did your father uh, tell you any stories about what it was like at that point, the Cold War is really getting underway? Um, again, um, doing management level recruitment training, uh, there are, there are in, in his time, there are a lot of off-premise think tank situations going on uh, where they were assembling a dozen people in focus circle groups um, and talking about strategic managerial development um, and how it related to the needs of what the agency was looking for. Mm -hmm. So um, for him, it was um, highly, highly engaging, uh, highly rewarding. Um, and uh, as I had mentioned, um, you know, he uh, had almost completed his doctorate level studies. He was, uh, he was a thinker and he was, uh, I think, challenged in that role. So what happened after he left the Pentagon? Uh, after this time there, uh, he actually went into the private sector and ended up working for, at the time, one of the country's largest consultancy firms, um, Booz Allen and Hamilton, and uh, ended up being posted in Chicago for a number of years until he took over um, as senior managing director uh, for their affairs in the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, Asia and Africa. And uh, he was working uh, very closely with um, the Saudi government, with the Iranian government, with countries, governments from North Africa mm -hmm. um, in assisting with um, privatization of their oil resources mm -hmm. and uh, creating oil pipelines and basically layering in what would be, uh, what would come to be um, OPEC um, and laying the groundwork uh, for our current oil industry. Mm -hmm. Let's step back a little bit. Um, I know your father was classically trained musician and he had the band. Did he continue uh, music when he was in the service and just after? Oh, my father always played the piano, whether it was uh, at the officers club uh, when they were uh, in Japan uh, or, or after. Um, he always traveled with a baby grand piano um, and growing up with him, uh, there was a Steinway and Sons piano in our home, which I still have today, um, and that piano logged more miles than most people could possibly imagine, <laughs> uh, traveling from the Middle East mm. to Europe to Africa and back multiple times. Just curious, uh, what kind of music did he prefer? He loved jazz and boogie-woogie, and um, he, he could play a mean uh, bass line, um, but you know, that was, that's where his heart and soul was. Okay, let's get back to your father in his civilian career. He is uh, helping lay out the groundwork for OPEC and the oil industry pretty much as we have it today. You had a story about him and his experience with Iran. Well, yes, during that time uh, when he was living in Iran, this is before the overthrow of the Shah, uh, he was working with... Um, directly with the ministers to try and orchestrate this deal, which was involving four different countries, two major corporations, and over a dozen sub-corporations to put together what was a very complex uh, operation between um, piping, drilling, refining, exporting, and selling a product globally that had never been done before. Um, and unfortunately, at uh, the time of the overthrow of the Shah, his business partner uh, in business, who was an employee of the government, was uh, hung um, in public. It was a changing of the times. And he was lucky to make it out unscathed. Um, and it was 
uh, a great triumph, but a sad memory. Indeed. So how uh, I understand that he actually worked until in, into his 80s. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, he had his own private firm doing consultancy work. He was living between England and Ireland for a number of years um, uh, in the early 1970s um, and then later on uh, into the uh, back end of the 70s, uh, moved back to the United States. So now we're around 1976, um, is actually when I was born, and uh, was working for uh, the private sector again, working for Chase Manhattan Bank. Uh, we were living in New York City, and he was a vice president with Chase Manhattan Bank for a number of years. Uh, and then we hit the recession in the early 80s, um, and that position was eliminated. And my father went to go... Uh, back to work for the government, where he did work for USAID, USAID, which is a branch of the government that focuses on um, assisting the development of private sector uh, in the third world. And this is by use of earmarked funds that the United States contributes uh, into the emerging worlds. So um, he ended up spending the next 15 years working in North uh, West, East, and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, working in uh, Chad, Sierra Leone, Ghana, the Ivory Coast, Cameroon, Zaire, Uganda, Kenya, um, for many years, uh, where he was based in Abidjan, in the Ivory Coast. He was based in Kinshasa, in former Zaire. Mm -hmm. He was based in Kampala, in Uganda. Uh, where he was holding the rank and title of uh, Deputy Executive Director of the uh, local Ugandan Investment Authority, for example, um, and did some amazing work there, uh, basically working with uh, the local government and the local president uh, and ministries to market these third world countries to the emerging world, the rest of the world, for private sector development. I uh, was very successful in that, um, and he did end up working uh, his last assignment up until his early 80s. Amazing. I know he was kind of bouncing around the world, but did he have a chance to join any veterans organizations like the Legion or the VFW? He did, was a member of the Legion um, in your report, and actually when he was um, retired, he used to actually give many speeches at local uh, gatherings for Memorial Day or Veterans Day, and he would give speeches at local schools um, and uh, working closely with those organizations, um, whether he was speaking at cemeteries uh, or um, at uh, in other public service areas. Um, but he was active in that, I would say, for about four or five years. Okay. And we know that your father passed away recently. Our condolences to you and your family. Thank you. And he did spend some time here at the Bedford VA. Yes. Um, my father passed in February of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was um, taken in as a uh, long-term patient uh, in November um, of, of last year. And... Did he have anything to say about the care he was given? He thought that the care was splendid. It was spectacular, mm -hmm. as I did as well. Um, you can really feel the dedication, mm -hmm. um, the passion to serve and to give the kind of care and respect to veterans who have served. Mm -hmm. um, it was very endearing. I spent um, many, many days here uh, being well cared for as my father was by the staff here. And uh, as I mentioned to the doctors and the aides and the nurses and the staff, um, I've actually never in my life seen a more genuinely caring, committed, uh, professional staff than, than 
here. Okay. And did your father ever say how important was it for him to serve in the military? It was extremely important. It was the foundation of his desire to continue exploring the world, mm -hmm. to continue um, to understand different cultures. Mm -hmm. It gave him a sense of order um, and it gave him a sense of service and passion and dedication. Um, he always referred back to his time as in the service is, 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 is an absolute wonderful experience. Now Arnold, uh, are there any other stories about your father that you can recall at this moment that we haven't covered yet? Well, there are so many stories it's difficult yeah. <laughs> to pick. Um, he was an avid um, photographer. Mm -hmm. uh, he loved to document the things he had seen. My father had an amazing art collection. He was a collector, so whether he was going to the digs firsthand in the Middle East, uh, he has a beautiful uh, pottery collection that uh, the pieces date back, not hundreds, but even over a thousand years old. Um, the African art collection that he amassed um, over almost two decades um, was carefully collected and put together. Um, he loved the arts. He loved mm -hmm. music. He loved uh, paintings and uh, sculpture. And so he really was um, a thinker. He was a writer. Uh, he was a lover of music and the arts. And he truly was a Renaissance man. And I understand you also had relatives who served in the military. Would you like to mention them? Yes, uh, actually both of my uncles, um, the husbands of um, my two aunts. So Donald Phillips served in the United States Marine Corps during the Second World War. And William Sullivan served the United States Navy during the Second World War. Both of them served in the Pacific Theater. Mm -hmm. They're both uh, now deceased. And is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap things up? It's been a pleasure and an honor to be able to share the story. Mm -hmm. And I hope that my father's story lives on and can contribute to um, what a great country we have and the memory of a great time in this great country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you, Arnold Lassaud, for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. My pleasure.